We can start now. Hello to everyone. Welcome to our online conference today. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Hasan Kami Sucu. I am the program manager of the neurosurgery department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital. I can ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecturer in order to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions not by opening your microphones, but by writing to the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meeting. When writing your questions and comments, please do not forget to write your full name, title, institution, and city information. And now, I would like to introduce our guest. It is my privilege to introduce our lecturer, Professor Dr. Edward Benzel. I will, I will make Dr. Benzel's introduction shorten, otherwise it may take hours. The curriculum ID that I used is 159 pages. He has countless positions, memberships, presidencies, research, books, publications, conferences, inventions, patents, and awards. Dr. Benzel was born on December 13, 1948 in Spokane, Washington. Dr. Benzel graduated from Chemical Engineering of Washington State University in 1971. Dr. Benzel earned his medical degree at the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1975. He spent his first postgraduate year in the surgery clinics of Medical College of Wisconsin between 1975 and 1976. He continued his medical training at the Medical College of Wisconsin with a residency in neurosurgery between 1976 and 1980 and a fellowship in spine surgery and spinal cord injury at Medical College of Wisconsin between 1980 and 1981. The milestones in his duties after medical training that I consider important in chronological order, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, Medical College of Wisconsin, 1980-1981. Assistant Professor of Surgery, Division of Neurosurgery, Louisiana State University, 1981 to 1986. Associate Professor of Surgery, Louisiana State University, 1986 to 1989. Professor and Chief Division of Neurosurgery, University of New Mexico, 1989-1999. Director, Spinal Disorders, Department of Neurosurgery, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, 1999-2003. Chairman, Cleveland Spine Institute, 2003-2007. Chairman, Cleveland Clinic, Department of Neurosurgery, 2007 to 2014. From 2014 till now, staff neurosurgeon in the Center of Spine Health of Cleveland Clinic. He has a total of 27 association membership in the past and present. He has been actively involved in, in the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, American Association of Neurological Surgery, North American Spine Society, World Spinal Columns Society and Cervical Spine Research Society. Dr. Benzel is one of the founder members of the Lumbar Spine Research Society formed in 2007. However, perhaps the most important thing for us is that, be, is that he has been an honorary member of Turkish Neurosurgical Society since 2007. He is currently the chairman of the review board for the Journal of Neurosurgery Spine. He has served as a reviewer for neurosurgery, spine, and the spine journal, and is an ad hoc reviewer for several other journals. He organized numerous meetings and courses. Since 2000, he has been the course director of the annual Cleveland Spine Review, hands-on courses. He has authored 10 textbooks and contributed to over 370 book chapters including his seminal text, Biomechanics of Spinal Spine Stabilization and Spine Surgery, Techniques, Complications, Evidence, and Management. Dr. Benzel holds 10 patents and has participated in many medical advances. He is perhaps best known and educator. His innovation in neurosurgery resistance education have won accolades and numerous awards. Dr. Benzel has 800 and 78 publications, 
index in Web of Science. The Web of Science age index is 46. The number of stations in Web of Science is 7,627. Sir, please welcome. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, you're, you're, you're correct. It almost as long as my talk. Uh, um, I really, um, I love Turkey. I've probably been there, um, um, in, visited Turkey uh, 14, 15 times over the years. I, uh, I have a spe special affection for the country and for the people and for the neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons who I, whose friendship I value dearly. I'm going to talk about today about uh, a, a, um, an exciting topic to me, and I'm going to address the things I have learned over the last two decades regarding cervical spondylotic myelopathy and deformity. And I'm going to call this my journey, because indeed it has been a journey for me. I am going to begin with a discussion of biomechanics, um, because it is the fundamental uh, science for what we do with deformity surgery and for the prevention of deformity. Just as an aside, every operation we do on the spine is a deformity operation. It can, it can prevent a deformity, it can treat a deformity, or it has the potential to cause a deformity. So the understanding of the mechanics is critical for every spine operation and every spine surgeon. I will begin with the biomechanics of spinal column failure. And the fundamental equation in, in this arena is this here. Bending moment is the product of the force times the distance. <clears throat> a force F applied at a distance D from an axis of rotation, we'll call it the instantaneous axis of rotation because it changes from moment to moment, causes the product of these two causes a bending moment, which causes stress on the spine. It initiates the stress ventrally, uh, which initiates failure, which is then propagated dorsally. All points ventral to the IAR come closer together and all points dorsal to the IAR become farther apart. The biomechanics of spine instrumentation fundamentally is the um, art uh, of reversing that process, the me mechanism of failure, either the mechanism of failure or preventing failure. Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Uh, we basically think in the spine as we should about the Cartesian coordinate system, the XYZ system um, with the center of that, uh, of, of the um, focus being at the instantaneous axis of rotation. There are movements about each axis and along each axis. Again, this force times this distance causes a, a flexion deformity, which initiates intensifies intensifies the um, forces applied ventrally, which initiates ventral failure and then propagates dorsally. So there are fundamentally six mechanisms that we can use as surgeons to resist or correct deformity. The first is simple distraction. If we distract in the interbody region, uh, in the area of the axis of rotation, we apply simple distraction. But if we were to distract dorsally, say at the level of the spinous processes, we would cause a possibly cause an unwanted um, ventral flexion or kyphosis uh, deformity of the spine. 
Uh, this is three-point bending, typified by a man standing on a springboard. The two forces, the man pointing down and the, 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 dorsal, the posterior attachment here, the sum of these two equals the upward force at the, at the fulcrum. When we apply these forces, we stabilize the spine and the longer the springboard or the longer the, the uh, lever arm or the longer the rod or plate, the greater the three-point bending fixation forces are applied. The third type is compression or tension band fixation. We traditionally talk about this as being a posterior applied force. Uh, we can do that with a circlage wire or a clamp, et cetera. But there are other ways in which we can apply compression, and I will discuss that a bit later. The last three are cantilevers. A cantilever is a beam that is affixed to an immobile object like a wall or a screw that is attached to a plate at one end only. If it's rigidly affixed, we'll call it a fixed moment arm cantilever beam. If it's affixed by a hinge, for example, like a screw that could toggle in a plate, we'll call it a non-fixed moment arm cantilever beam. And we can apply bending moments. Perhaps the best known, well-known method of applying a bending moment to the spine is with a cast bar pin. We can uh, move the pin, uh, distract the two pins or compress them and cause uh, kyphosis or lord or lord dorsis by doing such. Well, the implants and the spine can fail. Um, this is an illustration of the boundary effect. If I push my thumb on the edge of a tin can, I have significant resistance to compression. If, however, I push in the middle, I can indent the middle a bit because it does not have the wall or the boundary effect to support it. Henceforth, um, uh, cages or spacers that are placed are more appropriately spaced towards the perimeter of the end plate in the inner body region than in the center. The ones on the right will be more likely to subside. Uh, implants can fracture. They don't really fail. The surgeon fails, the implant fractured. These screws fractured at their base. And interestingly, this screw fractured near the tip. <clears throat> Why is that so? Well, rule number one, implants fracture at the point of maximum stress application. That is uh, absolute rule. Fracture at the point of maximum stress application. So now let's define stress. First, we'll define strength or zeta. It's proportional to the third power of the diameter of a rod or the inner diameter of a screw. Stress or theta is equal to bending moment over strength or section modulus. Strength should be thought of as section modulus. So this section modulus isn't very great where this hole is placed. And henceforth, it is exposed to a tremendous amount of stress when loading, say, in a three-point bending manner. So the bending moment is high um, and the section modulus is low leading to an increased stress. So let's look at this screw that fractured at its base. Its characteristic predominantly is that it is a fixed inner diameter screw. So the, uh, the strength of the screw is the same as we pass all the way along the screw. This is a tapered inner diameter screw. And so the strength will be greater at the base than it will be at the tip. Let's look at this from a graphical perspective. If we have a fixed inner diameter screw um, and, we apply, and it's fixed rigidly to a plate, this would be a fixed moment arm 
cantilever beam, um, we would see the bending moment rise linearly as we pass along the screw. And henceforth, the, um, the stress increasing linearly as we pass along the screw. So the stress is maximum here. And if this screw fractured, it is most likely going to fracture at or near its base or connection with the plate. So why would this screw fracture uh, uh, near the tip of the screw? Well, the, if we load the screw that's rigidly affixed to a plate, um, we can see that the um, bending moment will increase linearly as we pass along the screw. And so the bending moment, like the fixed inner diameter screw, is maximum at the plate. <clears throat> But the denominator is quite different here. The denominator is related to strength. And remember that the strength is proportional to the third power of the inner diameter of the screw. And as we pass along this screw, we see that the denominator of this equation, this stress equation um, goes up exponentially. And so the screw is very strong at its base and very weak here. And although it will rarely fracture, when it does, it will fracture near the tip. Screw that, screws that toggle uh, can interrupt if they abut the, uh, a bone graft that has subsided, abut that process, and they can leave a zone of a windshield wiping, wipering effect. Um, which isn't necessarily desirable, um, but that subsidence can lead on to fusion, as was the case here. This is an example. Uh, it's, this is an old case from Europe um, in which a mid-generation Caspar plate, and for most of the surgeons on this uh, uh, listening here today, um, you probably never heard of a Caspar plate. Well, this was one of the first anterior plating systems used by surgeons. And with this plate, um, we saw in this particular patient, uh, screws that fractured, screws that didn't fracture. Screws that backed out, screws that didn't back out. The interesting part of this uh, um, situation is that this patient has a solid fusion at every level. And look at the plate, how far down is has subsided past the end plate of the last vertebrae. And you say, well, I thought when you have uh, screws fracture or dislodge, the, the reason usually is, is pseudoarthrosis. Well, in this case, as the plate subsided along the vertebral bodies, the screw, which is a fixed inner diameter, um, was, uh, was exposed to three-point bending forces. And we've already talked about them with the bending moment maximum in the middle, which is going to be where the maximum stress is since this is a fixed inner diameter screw. And so these screws are most likely to fracture in the middle if they do. So here, here we go. Here's a fracture in the middle, a fracture in the middle, and so on and so forth, or they backed out. Now, why did this happen? And why did some screws uh, stay, stay and basically hold the spine together so that it could go on to fuse? Well, in this particular plate, there were two holes and a slot, a slot and two holes, two holes and a slot, and so on and so forth. The screws in slots held and allowed the, the plate to subside, uh, the spine to subside along the plate. And the, the spine surgeon basically designed or dialed in the contour of the spine by the virtue of the contour of the plate. And so the spine subsided along the curvature dictated by the curvature of the plate. And so we see in this case, the effect of subsidence on fracturing screws and causing backup back out, but we also see the importance of the screw that it was in a slot holding its position. Again, we see the same thing here. This is a screw that toggles. 
Implants function differently under different loading conditions. Um, um, so I asked the question to you all, is there such a thing as a ventral compression implant? Um, we know there are posterior compression implants. We can pass wires around this, or we can put clamps, et cetera. Um, but can we do the same thing uh, ventrally? Well, um, although there are ventral compression implants, they're not all that common. And here we see a, a dorsal compression implant, a circlage wire. But can this device here function as a ventral compression implant? Now, stay with me here because this is very important. What I'm going to say next um, can pertain to a lot of failures that we have. Uh, and had we thought through this a bit in advance, we may not see a failure. So this device placed in the ventral uh, spine here would resist compression because it is a fixed moment arm cantilever beam. Uh, so when a compressive load is, uh, an axial load is placed, it resists that by applying distraction. Um, um, but what about when it's in place and the patient tries to extend his or her neck? It is going to resist extension and henceforth is applying compression ventrally, making this implant a distraction device a cantilever beam, and actually under some circumstances, a compression device. And if we don't think through all of the forces that can impact upon um, the spine by the implant we place, we might see greater incidence of failure. So we can, we have loading modes, uh, we can distract, we can apply compression, we can apply three-point bending, and we have all these cantilevers. Here's a long device, a bridging implant. Bridging meaning no intermediate points of fixation. Now, we know that this implant has a high incidence of failure, uh, but why is that? It's not because it doesn't bear axial loads well, it actually bears axial loads very well, but what it doesn't resist is translation or rotation because this is such a long moment arm any motion back and forth will put a lot of stress on the spine and the screw bone interface and potentially result in failure as we see here. If the surgeon ha would have kept one intervening vertebral body and placed a screw or two screws into it, um, he would have created a three-point bending fixation device, which this technique does not offer. And therefore, the entire system would move uh, in unison when it moved and would not have prevented this. So when thinking through a construct and what you're going to em uh, employ for a patient, use as many of those fixation modes as you can, like this or this. However, um, this is, represents two operations. Uh, potentially, this might be better um, because you avoid a second operation in, often in firm or somewhat debilitated patients. Now, that was the preface. Now I'm going to talk about my journey. Um, which is basically uh, cervical spondylosis basically presents to us as uh, myelopathy and or radiculopathy and deformity. Cervical spondylotic myelopathy is an encroachment and tethering phenomenon, and the progressive myelopathy is often the result of repetitive trauma, uh, the trauma of sitting down hard or bending the neck, et cetera. I'm not talking about falls, although that, uh, or automobile accidents, although that most certainly can add to the trauma. Here I have eight people, um, all of whom have a fixed 
deformity of the cervical spine, all of whom present with um, a web neck, so to speak. We'll we, we're gonna call that the kyphosis trapezius sign, perhaps best illustrated right here. The trapezius muscle is an accessory muscle of neck extension. So if the erector spinae are either weakened in some way or, are, or the deformity is a fixed deformity, the, 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 uh, the trapezius muscle is reflexively activated and adds to a significant pain syndrome like a myofascial pain syndrome. So that is the kyphosis trapezius sign. We can see this right here. Obviously, this patient is very uncomfortable, struggling to get his neck back into a more comical position. But all, every one of those patients also complained of back pain. Here is, is one of them, and here is her construct. She had a placed at an outside hospital an occiput to cervical fusion. Um, and, um, but the problem is she was uh, fused in a slightly kyphotic posture. In other words, her head is looking down. So what does she have to do in order to look forward? She has to bend her knees a little bit and bend backwards. What she is therefore doing is overloading her facet joints in the lumbar spine, causing back pain. This is perhaps a bit more graphical. This lady has a C3-4 um, kyphotic problem, and you can see how she, even with the leaning backwards that she does, really struggles at looking forward. So, we have uh, non-operative strategies to take care of some of these deformities. We can use postural treatments uh, to say, for example, not using a pillow at night. But nobody told this gentleman with ankylosing spondylitis when he was in his 20s <clears throat> that he should use a shallow pillow or no pillow at all and throughout his life work on postural um, mechanics so that he does, he prevents something occurring like this. When he was laying in bed, it was simply more comfortable for him to flex his neck, so he did. And gradually, it has assumed this posture. We can also <clears throat> have the patients do a series of exercises, perhaps the most important one <clears throat> of the core strengthening exercises is this one, where the patient pushes forward with his hands and pushes backwards with his neck, to, in order to exercise the erector spinae muscles. I've used this in patients who I've elected not to operate on, and it has helped some people, but I have not seen the deformity objectively change, but I have seen symptomatic improvement. So sur surgical strategies uh, um, are, are critical, and that's basically what I'm gonna talk about for the remaining part of this session. <clears throat> so. One of the things that we know from a study by Gogo Walla et al. that I help participate in is, is that when there is a significant uh, sagittal vertical axis, and that is the measurement from mid-body of C7 to the mid uh, end plate of C2 in the standing position, when this is over <clears throat> uh, 15 or so millimeters, patients tend to have more neck pain. So fusing a patient in this position, although is probably <clears throat> good and effectively treated her uh, stenosis and myelopathy, her uh, health-related health quality of life metrics were much worse than this patient. <clears throat> this is a patient of my own, so please learn from my mistakes and don't make this mistake yourself. This was a... 60 year old lady with cervical myelopathy. This is her pre op uh, cervical spine flexion and extension x ray. This is her post op x ray. I failed this person miserably because if you look, she's going to have a pretty significant sagittal vertical axis here. 
uh, from about right here to about right here. It's probably, oops, probably more like uh, 20 millimeters or more. And although her myelopathy improved, she had significant neck pain uh, that has persisted to this day. And this operation was probably done seven, eight years ago. So we must be diligent. I repeatedly brake scrub and try to move the head back with the Mayfield head holder. Dan Rune, orthopedic surgeon from New York, um, uses this technique, which he calls the bivector technique, with the patient prone on a Jackson table. You apply normal traction with this uh, rope going forward. And when you are beginning to correct deformity, you apply the traction through this rope, which goes over a bar that is, uh, puts the head in significant extension. So this is a picture of that. I can tell you that I've tried this a couple of times and it makes me very nervous. First of all, when you're, when you're, when you're dissecting and operating, um, the, the head bobs up and down a little bit. And so you're really relying on the integrity of the, the device attaching to the skull. Obviously there is a, a fail safe, a, a pad here to catch it, but um, I have basically abandoned this approach. Here's another picture. So when dealing with cervical spondylotic myelopathy, we should focus on deformity. Why? We can diminish neck pain, myelopathy, decrease and fusion degenerative changes, improve short-term and long-term success. Um, it is easier to correct deformity ventrally uh, because we can apply a lot of more strategies. Uh, dorsally, we really have to um, basically extend the spine, extend the spine, extend the spine by multiple uh, attempts um, uh, with the surgeon breaking scrub. But bottom line is it's all about leverage. I already mentioned one way to uh, extend the spine is using an applied bending moment with a cast bar pin. You put the uh, the pins in um, uh, convergently, and then when the, uh, the distractor is hooked up to them, we have straightened out the spine. <clears throat> we can bring the bone to the implant. Uh, we can create the contour of the spine that we want with the contour of the plate that we desire, <clears throat> and then with intermediate screws, gradually tighten them sequentially as we pull the bone back to the implant. Here's an illustration of that, a kyphotic spine, and tighten the screws and make turn it into a, uh, a lordotic spine. And here's an, another example of that. We can also use gravity in, in the, the supine position. Um, and when we do use gravity to our uh, advantage, we are using a principle of viscoelasticity. Viscoelasticity is the phenomenon whereby a body gradually deforms with the ap ap application of a constant load. So let's take this person as an example. She's a 68-year-old female with progressive myelopathy, uh, significant uh, um, um, kyphosis trapezius sign, and a lot of neck pain. Um, we got an MRI on here, and this image is over 20 years old. So this is where my, um, uh, my uh, journey began. Here the image is September 19th or September 11th, 1999. A couple of things I noticed here is that she has a signal change. <clears throat> well, she has a myelopathy and I understand that. But look, there is no compression here. <clears throat> In fact, if you look throughout <clears throat> the spine, there is no level at which there is not some patency to the uh, CSF subarachnoid space. We knew we could correct her ventrally uh, because her facets weren't ankylosed. You can see this, that she had some motion. <clears throat> In fact, we could see <clears throat> the vertebral bodies open up a bit in extension with her. So we put her on an operating table with a roll under her shoulder and a donut beneath her head. We began doing um, 
discectomies <coughs> and releasing procedures. And um, then took the pillow from beneath her head. We then used Caspar pins, uh, brought the bone to the implant and used these four intermediate screws in order to achieve that and converted a 15 degree kyphosis to a five degree lordosis. Now that's not normal, but it's probably good enough. And we took that. <clears throat> it's all about leverage. It's difficult to get this same thing in the prone position. However, we still use the same property of viscoelasticity. We try to straighten the patient's head out more, then we do some more work, then we come back and we move it a little bit more, then we do some more work, and then we come back maybe again, and we don't stop until we're satisfied. <clears throat> and I will tell you what I think that endpoint is. I'll give you a, a, a hint right now. It has to do with a C23 interspace. When that interspace is horizontal to the floor in the standing position, the spine is in a normal sagittal balance and will not place excessive stresses to adjacent motion signals. When it's not, like in this case, it results in a painful uh, attempt by the patient to readjust that uh, the spine and try to achieve that balance. Fixation follows. Again, you could have argued that we should have done a ventral approach and then a dorsal approach, but if we'd have used one long strut ventrally, we would have not had the advantage of pulling the bone to the implant that we did with her prior procedure. And we would, we would have needed to do two separate operations. And here's that strategy that would be lost if we did a long interbody fusion and also did a corpectomy at this level. Here she is post-op. First of all, her signal change in her spinal cord disappeared. Don't count on that. I think we were just lucky. But her myelopathy immediately began improving. And um, we, uh, we were very happy with that. And she was very happy with that. But it was sort of a head scratcher for me. We went from this to this. And she had a, a great result. <clears throat> Again, we scratched our head and thought things over. About three years later, along this journey, <clears throat> came this man, 72-year-old male, who had previously, he's from Puerto Rico, had a laminectomy 10 years prior, and he had it for myelopathy, and his myelopathy improved. But now he presents with myelopathy again, or progressive myelopathy again, and his surgeon sends him to me because he says, what's going on here? This is a normal, uh, you know, there's no compression on the spinal cord. Is there some sort of a neurodegenerative disorder? Well, we must remember that cervical spinal myelopathy, as I said at the outset, is a result of repetitive trauma and tethering and distraction. So we got flexion x-rays and extension x-rays. He can't really extend his neck very much, but his facet joints aren't arthrosed. Every single one of them moves. They just have um, spurs in them that don't allow them to extend fully. So I thought, let's see what this looks like with an MRI in flexion and extension. Well, here's his flexion MRI. This is probably what people refer to as a post-laminectomy syndrome or membrane. But look at how flattened the cord is in flexion and how open it is in extension or neutral. So we knew we could correct him dorsally because uh, we, he, we could relax and release him by doing facet osteotomies. <clears throat> and that we did. Here's the facet osteotomies at multiple levels. We got him corrected fairly well. <clears throat> um, it, it, it isn't perfect, uh, but we pounded our chests and said, this is great. Um, and he did well. His myelopathy began within a day to improve. 
And all we really did in that regard is stopped the trauma. Every time he looked forward or bent forward, he was traumatizing his spinal cord and repeatedly traumatizing his spinal cord. And we stopped that trauma. Uh, but um, he came back uh, a couple of years later to his uh, original surgeon with this. So um, we didn't get this disc space to a complete uh, horizontal uh, ar arrangement or relationship to the floor in the standing position. Plus with the two prior operations he had, he probably had some injury to the C23 facet capsule. And regardless of the etiology, he began topping off, if you will. <clears throat> the facet angle uh, was too steep. And so his surgeon did this, he got it back fairly well. Uh, and it is difficult to get a correction uh, at this level, C23 level, because of the anatomy of the facet joints, et cetera. And I had occasion to see him about three or four years after this operation, <clears throat> because he had come to Cleveland for some reason. And he was very happy. So even though he isn't uh, completely aligned perfectly, <clears throat> he's happy. And probably the re reason for that is that we have um, basically fixated uh, from C2 and he's not breaking down at the C23 joint. About three or four years later, a 32 year old gentleman presented to me, uh, having been treated for this uh, traumatic um, um, C7, I think it's three, four, five, six, seven, C7, T1 disc uh, with this operation. <clears throat> the surgeon, because the patient had neck pain, took out the implant and he gave it to the patient. And here it is. <clears throat> but this is his neck. He's fused in a, in, in a kyphotic posture. So he has the kyphosis trapezius sign. He complains bitterly of back pain. He has no compression but he's got a fixed kyphotic deformity. <clears throat> so we took him to the operating room and did facet osteotomies. Uh, and again, I'm gonna illustrate these facet, facet osteotomies in a bit uh, so that you clearly understand what I'm talking about. I used an additional strategy here of trapezoidal graphs. Um, I brought the bone to the implant. I used cast bar pins to correct his deformity. So we loosened him up here and then placed vent ventral instrumentation. So here he is. Look at his neck. He has no back pain. Um, and he is, uh, ve was very happy <clears throat> with his results. Sometimes <clears throat> there's areas of the spine that we should not enter. <clears throat> this is a lady with neurofibromatosis who uh, presented with um, severe neck pain and she's had multiple operations um, and basically has a, uh, a ear, uh, on, ear on shoulder <clears throat> deformity. You can see that I guess with regard to her uh, neurofibromatosis, she has uh, vertebral artery ectasia. <clears throat> she's got these, vas these clamps that are in place and <clears throat> she has a, a significant um, curvature of her upper cervical spine uh, in a scoliotic posture. Just a, a CT scan to illustrate that. We felt that this would be a horrendous job to take down this fusion uh, and it would be precarious and risky. So here she is Priya. <clears throat> um, I, we put her prone on the table with her head tilted a bit uh, to the side in the way she normally sits. And then we began doing osteotomies. Um, and I, at the, when we're close to being done, I went below the table and put her head into a neutral coronal position. And as we did the last osteotomy um, right here, you can see it, the things just 
hot. Uh, it opened up and everything sort of relaxed. So that was great. But remember this, if you do this type of an operation, make sure you get a consent from the patient or inform the patient that there is a potential for vertebral artery injury by stretching uh, when you actually reduce this deformity. So our intent was to leave this deformity, here's the skull and here's C2 with uh, the significant and robust mass of bone. <clears throat> um, and so we said, we can take advantage of this and fuse to her um, existing bony fusion mass. And here is the picture of this. And here is her x-ray. <clears throat> In advance, when I do an operation like this, I tell the patients, what you see in the end <clears throat> is not gonna be pretty. We, our job as surgeons is not to make the post-operative x-rays look pretty. Our job as surgeons is to take advantage of the anatomy that is offered to us. And in this case, we did, and here she is pre-op and post-op, and she was very happy. This is a post-op CT. She had a little upper thoracic scoliosis, which may have precipitated some of this um, uh, compens compensatory problem. <clears throat> but regardless, she was very happy with this result. Sometimes <clears throat> you should uh, entertain two stages. That is for oftentimes for length of operation, blood loss, et cetera. At any rate, we did such with this lady. She had a prior fusions and pseudoarthroses and compression and kyphosis trapezius sign and back pain. And here is her CT scan. We had reason to believe that we could probably um, extend her neck because of the pseudoarthroses if we just took um, the implant out from behind. So we took her to the operating room um, and to, uh, um, we took her to the operating room and did a dorsal procedure because we felt we could not adequately approach the spine because of her body habitus. Um, and so we did a decompression and facet osteotomies and we could not, this is the, in, the, in the era before intraoperative uh, CT scans, and we could see down to about here because of her shoulders intraoperatively. And so we said, we don't think we have good enough correction. Let's take, let's close the wound, uh, take her to the intensive care unit and leave her in mild traction, but in extension. And then let's get a, a, a CT in several days, which we did, and this is the CT we got. And we said, this looks good enough, we'll take it. We'll take her to the operating room. And we did this construct. Um, we went way down, and I think down to T4 or three because uh, of her uh, heavy head. And the fact that we wanted to get good fixation, we used translaminar screws uh, at C2. And here's her CT before surgery. <clears throat> Here's her CT in between the two operations. So I'm gonna stop this rotation right here and discuss facet osteotomy. When one is doing a posterior cervical operation, one should always look at the MRI and or CT to look for vertebral artery anomalous positions. If there is no anomalous vertebral artery, then the, um, the exiting nerve roots, except at, C2, except at C1, 2, pass dorsal to the vertebral artery. And so if we do essentially a radical foramenectomy or foramenotomy and take it all the way out, not part of the way out, but all of the way out so that we completely dislodge that facet joint, and make sure there is no spurs right here so that when we close the book in extension, the um, does not impinge upon the neuroforamina. 
Um, then we get a picture that looks something like this. Let me. So here she is. Um, and her myelopathy improved. Uh, she lost weight for a while, uh, but uh, that was not sustained. But she did well with this operation. Um, and this was very high risk. <clears throat> Here she is pre and post. So I promised you that I would discuss the C23 angle. We did a paper several years ago looking at the C23 angle postoperatively and found a very statistically significant relationship between reoperation pseudoarthrosis, progressive kyphosis, adjacent segment degeneration, and disease with C23 angles that were significantly sloped downward. So this angle is very critical, um, as depicted here, for um, determining, predicting success of your surgery from a health-related quality of life and a complication perspective. We also look uh, at the C7 T1 angle of this T1 slope. <clears throat> they should be used differently. The C7 T1 angle, if it's hor relatively horizontal to the floor, <clears throat> suggests that any problem that you see is probably going to be in the cervical spine. Whereas here, we see this significant slope in a patient with a significant sagittal vertical axis, and yet her upper, upper cervical spine is lordotic. Um, so this implies that the predominant um, uh, area of concern is the cervical thoracic junction, because this is the area in which the greatest deformity is occurring in this patient. So the C7T1 slope gives you preoperative uh, information that tells you where you should operate and implying what you should do. In other words, correct the deformity at the cervical thoracic junction with osteotomies or whatever strategy you choose to employ. The C23 angle, I use intraoperatively to gauge whether I have achieved enough deformity correction. So this is not enough deformity correction in either of these two. So here is a patient with all the problems. She's had lumbar surgery, she may have had lumbar surgery because she had neck problems. Um, and the neck problems caused them, the surgeons outside, to do um, uh, an operation on the lumbar spine. <clears throat> but be that as it may, she has kyphosis trapezius sign and significant um, um, uh, neck pain. Um, and here's her standing uh, x ray. Here, um, and so we decided since uh, she had a significant um, deformity and we could not correct any more here, we just left that alone, took out the screws and put in new screws. And so our deformity is gonna be corrected in the upper thoracic spine. And here we see facet osteotomies in areas that we can achieve that. And we corrected her deformity, but how do I know when to stop? So um, this is an intraoperative uh, picture uh, or x-ray. And we see that the C23 joint is perpendicular to the floor. So if we were to take this x-ray and flip it 90 degrees, we would see that C23 is roughly horizontal to the floor if she were in the standing position. Obviously, there's a little bit of air that is introduced here. And it's better to overcorrect than to undercorrect. And so here she is, pre-op and post-op and post-op. So I want to look at, I want you to look at her angle. C23 is pretty much horizontal to the floor, post-op. Here she is uh, sloping downward, pre-op. 
also look at what's happened. <clears throat> Her plumb line now fits, sits in front of the lumbar spine, which is probably where it should be given all the problems that she has. And it was before behind the lumbar spine because she's leaning backwards here in order to see forwards, just like all those people that I showed you at the beginning of this part of the talk. So my journey is not over uh, by a long shot. I plan on continuing this for a long time, but this is the most recent addition to the cases in my journey. I've been following this gentleman as a 34 year old male with small fiber neuropathy and upper cervical kyphosis for a long time. He also happened to have a, a C1-2 uh, um, schwannoma, um, which uh, allowed me to do an operation to resect the schwannoma and get an idea as to how mobile his spine was. But this is his spine and he's got this upper cervical kyphosis due to his small fiber neuropathy and weakened erector spinae muscles and a uh, compensatory hyperlordosis in the uh, low cervical spine. Here he is just lying on the table and he kind of, when he relaxes, he looks okay. And he's got a little stenosis down here, which we said we'll, we'll take care of with his surgery. During his schwannoma surgery, I knew that his spine was very mobile. And so I thought we may have to fuse him from C2 to T1 or T2, but I think there's a good chance we can go down to C6. So here he is, his scoliosis views preoperatively. He's got this little hump at the thoracic, uh, thoracolumbar junction. He actually complain, complains of a little pain here, it's not bad. Um, so we did a C4, an upper C5 laminectomy, <clears throat> a C4-5 bilateral foramenotomy, and a C2 through 5 instrumented fusion. And so as opposed to most operations with that are in very degenerated spines where you really can't manipulate the spine a tremendous amount during surgery, we were able to manipulate his youthful spine. So we bent rods in the position we wanted them and basically pushed them into the screw heads and then tightened them. And so here we are and we said, this is our prone x-ray. Here we have, this is perpendicular to the floor. So we felt we have a good, um, good end point, this being my C23 angle and that we have, um, now restored his upper cervical uh, lordosis. And here he is post-op. Again, pre-op to post-op. And again, <clears throat> here he is post-op, but if you compare his long, you know, his deformity here versus deformity here, he is actually normalized a bit. And I can't <clears throat> emphasize enough <clears throat> the importance of scoliosis views. I think we tend to often think linearly and say, well, I'm operating on a neck. Why do I care about what's going on in the rest of the spine? Well, every segment is connected to the next and it can have a domino effect. <clears throat> and to fully understand and appreciate the pathophysiology and the pathobiomechanics, uh, scolio uh, I liberally use scoliosis views. Now I'm gonna close <clears throat> with a discussion of total disc arthroplasty, which you say, what's this have to do with this problem? Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna make a case uh, against total disc arthroplasty and I am biased, I recognize that, but I would like to present some literature and some strategies and, and some notions that apply directly and indirectly to everything I've talked about. <clears throat> when we look at poly on, uh, like the Charité disc, poly on metal or metal on metal discs, um, and think of flexion and extension or axial loading, we need to be considered, uh, be considering which plane, axial translational or bending, along which axis, axial, coronal, or sagittal. <clears throat> this is a stress strain curve. 
uh, the neutral zone is right here. That is the zone of disengagement where it takes very little uh, load to deform the spine. Um, when we get to uh, this zone, which is the elastic zone, it takes a significantly increased load to deform the spine. And this is usually relatively linear and it is called the elastic zone and it is the slope of the stress strain curve. When we get to this point, we start to see early failure and then ultimate failure here. In a degenerated spine, the uh, biomechanical correlate of mechanical back pain or spine pain <clears throat> is a widened neutral zone. There is a lot more movement and sloppiness to the spine, if you will, that generates pain. So if we look at flexion and extension, uh, these discs basically allow a tremendous amount of flexion and extension without resistance. A polymeric disc might offer something like this, and a dynamic lumbar fixation device may move the curve to the left, but these don't seem to have been shown to be effective for treating back pain. Uh, there may be a lot of reasons for that, and to the biomechanical correlate of effusion is a steep or a very steep um, um, stress strain curve. So for the artificial disc, this really is, isn't normal. It isn't approaching normal. A, a normal disc is fairly stiff. If you take a cadaveric spine and hold it in your hands and bend it, it is a relatively stiff structure, particularly in the lumbar spine. Now let's look at axial loading. This is hard. It's poly on metal. When the spine is actually loaded, it looks like a fusion because it's very stiff and loads are trans transmitted to adjacent segments. These two look about the same. So uh, adjacent segments with discs like this <clears throat> um, will have loads transferred to them not necessarily be protected by the artificial disc. And in fact, it will cause same, same segment uh, transfer of load to the facet joints. Um, so is the, are these discs offloading or are they transferring loads? I suspect they're doing more of this than this. So the adjacent segment degeneration and disease has been a hot topic <clears throat> for a decade now. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk about disease that is symptomatic uh, adjacent segment degeneration. Um, <clears throat> there, there's a relatively rich history <clears throat> of, of uh, articles on this subject. Um, Hillebrand um, is one of the main actors here from um, from the Rothman Institute in, at Thomas Jefferson University in, in Philadelphia. Uh, they did a, a bunch of studies and they found that the prevalence of adjacent segment disease was nine to 17% and that it occurred at roughly 3% per year after um, uh, anterior cervical fusions. This an extraordinarily interesting study of 846 patients done at the University of Minnesota um, with the prevalence uh, in whom laminal foramenotomies, not a fusion, laminal foramenotomies for radiculopathy were performed. And they observed an annual incidence of adjacent segment disease to be 3% per year. That's the same as the Jefferson group saw for fusion. This is a non-fusion operation at the index level. Um, the group from Pittsburgh look at patients with anterior cervical discectomies with and without fusion, and they have found that the incidence was about the same in with and without fusion, and that the um, annual incidence is about 3% per year. And finally, uh, they did a study looking at, um, this is the group from Philadelphia, 
looking at ACDFs with single or multiple level fusions. <clears throat> and they found that the incidence, annual incidence was about 3% per year. But when they looked at the uh, um, incidence of ACDF was lower, uh, of uh, adjacent segment disease was lower in the group uh, with longer fusions than with single level fusions. So I don't know what this all means, um, but it, it uh, does imply that the fusion um, does not increase adjacent segment disease. Now, if you look in the literature, there is mounting literature, both biomechanical and clinical, suggesting that adjacent segment disease <clears throat> is related to posture not uh, or na or natural history, but related to posture, not the fact that there's the long fusion. And so when I look at our study that I've already mentioned, <clears throat> looking at reoperation pseudoarthrosis, kyphosis and adjacent segment disease at the C23 level and cervical operations, this probably pertains in the lumbar spine or maybe cervical spine after artificial discs or, or anterior fusions. <clears throat> and I suggest that if you were to do, <clears throat> both these patients did well <clears throat> with ACDFs. <clears throat> Sorry. And, um, but I don't know how this patient did, but I can, I would bet a lot of money that he has a lot greater chance of developing adjacent segment disease than this person who had uh, normalized his cervical lordosis with the operation versus this one where there's a focal kyphosis. <coughs> so that's my story. That's my journey. Uh, and I thank you very much. So thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I want to give myself the right to ask the first question. Okay, should I take my screen off here? <clears throat> uh, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so when you're applying a cervical plate, you place the upper and lower screws in a divergent manner. Uh, what is the logic behind this? Is biomechanically <clears throat> stronger? I, I, didn't, I, I didn't catch the first part of your question, okay. I'm sorry. When you're applying a cervical plate, cervical plate, you place the upper and lower screws in a divergent manner, uh, <coughs> not parallel. Uh, what is the logic behind this? Uh, well, if there's any subsidence, a upward screw at the top and a downward facing screw at the bottom will resist subsidence. And if there is subsidence, that the angle of those screws will draw the plate closer to the spine rather than pushing it away if the screws are aimed the other way. Is that, am I making sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Murat, can you please turn on the uh, microphone of Professor Zileli? Sure. Uh, hi, um, uh, dear Ed, um, it was, as usual, a great talk. Uh, thank you a lot. Well, thank you. It's good seeing you. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I have one uh, different question. Actually, the, there is a tendency that if you correct uh, some upper cervical uh, deformities, uh, that may reflect, that may have reflection in the up other uh, levels. Uh, Atul is uh, suggesting that he has corrected some upper cervical deformity and then resulting uh, with uh, thoracic uh, scoliosis correction. Do you think uh, there is such a coincidence or something? Well, I would guess that in patients like that, like I, 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 one of the last cases I showed 
the patient had an upper cervical operation and kyphosed at the thoracic, cervical thoracic junction. <clears throat> so I think a careful assessment of the T1 slope or the C7 T1 disc space is uh, critical in determining that potentially that patient should have had an upper cervical extending to upper thoracic, a C2 to T1 or T2 fusion, for example, with deformity correction, and possibly osteotomy. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is, this. Yeah, probably we are still having a lack of knowledge uh, about th those uh, balances and uh, we may have more balance-like things, uh, especially in the cervical spine. Uh, we don't know yet, probably yes. something. Well, please keep in mind that the thoracolumbar deformity surgeons are way ahead of us in, in the cervical spine, and that we were looking at pelvic parameters, uh, spinal pelvic parameters, 10 years before we started looking at the cervical equivalent cervical parameters, essentially. <clears throat> and so, yes, I, like I said, my journey is not over. We have a long way to go. There's a lot of many, many things that we do not fully understand. <clears throat> okay. Thank you a lot for being with us. Uh, and I thank us, uh, Kamil, uh, to let you uh, to be with us. Thank you. You bet. I'm, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Rafi Gilman from Izmir have a question. Uh, he wrote, if patient who have story about Parkinson disease, rheumatoid arthritis, kidney deficiency, or severe osteoporosis, need cervical instrumentation, what do you do for preventing instrument failure? What, what failure? Uh, as instrument failure. What do you In do? Part? for preventing instrument failure. In Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, kidney well, deficiency, or severe osteoporosis. So uh, basically, we did a study on, on Parkinson's disease and complications. And there most certainly is a greater complication rate with patients with Parkinson's disease. They stress the spine, they have abnormal motions, they are more debilitated, so they do not um, ambulate as rapidly as a, a, another patient might. <clears throat> but I wouldn't change anything with the operation. I do do the same operation in a patient with Parkinson's disease than I would for a patient without Parkinson's disease. And we, in both cases, we need to, to be a, a careful to apply the principles we discussed today and to use good surgical technique. I might, for example, if I was going to do a long fusion in a patient with Parkinson's disease, say from C2 to the thoracic spine, I might extend it, not just to T1, but might take it to T2, just to get an, uh, uh, simply to get an extra point of fixation in the thoracic spine. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Haluk Berg from Izmir uh, wrote that, uh, thank you, Ed, excellent as always. Professor Bektaş Açıkgöz, Lara Anadolu Hospital, Antalya. Thank you very much, Professor Benzel, for the excellent presentation and sharing your experience with us. He wrote. Uh, Professor Haluk Berg added, uh, so very true that adjacent segment disease is related to posture, not to fusion itself. He wrote. Professor Uygur wrote that, uh, dear Dr. Benzel, thank you for your nice presentation. What do you think on only one segment cervical stenosis and disc hernia at the same level? What is your surgical strategy? strategy? I, I didn't understand that. One more time. What do you think on only one level, one segment cervical stenosis and disc hernia at the same level? Discarnation and stenosis together at the same level. What well, is your surgical I, strategy? I, I'd probably do an ACDF. I mean, this, the stenosis is probably for the most part related to the disc hernia. 
Yes, I. I... Uh, Murat, it would. It would have. To, I'd have to individualize that. Can you turn on the uh, Uyghur Arabs microphone, please? Sure. Maybe you want to ask. Hi, Doctor Benzel. Good Hello. evening. Hello. Uh, my question is: the stenosis, true stenosis, uh, for example, a short pedicle, and at the same time, a soft disc herniation at the same level. What is your surgical strategy? ACDT first, or laminectomy, or laminoplasty first? Well, uh, is there stenosis at other levels too? Because if they have a short pedicle, no, no, same, same level, same level. <clears throat> I'd probably, depending on on the MRI, I'd probably start with an ACDF. But if it isn't a huge herniation, um, the problem. <clears throat> with this is that if you do a laminoplasty, you have to do two levels, and you're not uh, you're allowing the disc to herniate further because you're not eliminating motion. So I think that a, it may a ACDF with a plating and fusion may suffice as the only only operation. And if you're really worried and the herniation is small, a laminoplasty is a great operation. I I use them uh, frequently. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Yes. Thank, thank you, you. Professor Nurpali Ghazioglu wrote that. Thank you very much, Professor Benzel, for your comprehensive and excellent talk. Uh, Dr. Nilin Şenol, Süleyman Demiral University, wrote that it was an honor for me to listen to your perfect presentation. We learned many useful and practical information as always. Thank you so much, Dr. Benzel. Mm. Dr. Erkan Seven, uh, Mike from my clinic. I am so happy to hear with you. Thank you very much for your wonderful, wonderful speech. I hope one more time we can see you in our clinic in Izmir. I do. Let me just pause for a second with, with that comment. Uh, this pandemic has we have a, a wonderful world of neurosurgeons and a, a large family and friends that we've accumulated over the last two, two, three decades. And it's been stolen from us, the opportunity to visit and to uh, communicate. I just hope that um, some sort of normalcy will return and we can again, visit uh, again and have, um, have good times like we did before. Yeah, we, we do. <clears throat> Dr. Tuna Pehlivanoğlu wrote, uh, thank you for, your, for this great talk, Dr. Benzel, who gave me the very first lecture regarding spine surgery 13 years ago in Cleveland Clinic. Great to see you again. Thank you, Tuna. Uh, see, this is the thing. I've worked with people. Um, you know, so many people, both in, in Cleveland and in, in, in Turkey. And again, all of this has been halted. Um, again, we need to work to uh, overcome this virus. Uh, Dr. Güngör Ustad from Trabzon Medical Park Hospital wrote, thank you for your perfect pre presentation, sir. We watched how we correct hypotic necks with a great admiration. I want to learn does the extension position lead any neurological deficit at any patient with myelopathic core? So it, the question is, is there any deficits in extension? Yeah. Any deficits that can uh, be acquired in extension? Yeah, does the extension position lead to any neurological deficit? Yes, it can. I'm very cognizant when we do an, an operation like this to look at particularly the C45 uh, neuroforamina uh, after we've done the correction because of the obvious uh, problem associated with C5 palsy. But also it appears that at C7T1 with extension, uh, it, there's a greater incidence of traction and, and nerve injury. So always with these operations, 
uh, probe the foramina after this after the correction is achieved to make sure it is adequately decompressed. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Kemal Yuzoy has a very long question. Maybe he wants to ask himself. Murat, can you turn on the microphone of Kemal Yuzoy? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, hi, nice to see you again <laughs> in Turkey, you. in Izmir. Uh, I translated your biomechanics books with Dr. Nadire and Dr. Özgen many, many years ago. And it's so nice to see you again. Uh, without any changing, you are also handsome. You are also the <laughs> same. Uh, it's, it's so good for me, so nice for me. Well, yeah. let, me let me just say one thing here. Uh, I don't know how much different I look, but I can tell you that my running is getting a lot slower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And my question is, you show the importance of level C2, uh, especially for kyphosis. What do you think about the anterior approach to seven, uh, C2, 3 as a uh, hangman fracture, just uh, anterior approach with cage and plate? That's reasonable. However, the uh, lower C2 vertebral body ventrally is, has, is not rounded. It's actually more has more of an apex to it. Instead of being rounded, it's kind of like an apex, and plates don't sit there evenly. Number two, uh, it's a difficult angle to do the discectomy and get a good interbody fusion. And number three, dysphagia is a a problem with that. So if you're gonna, first of all, most Hangman's fractures do not need it surgery. Um, yeah, 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 and so. Uh, you know, you're relegated to a longer operation from behind uh, or uh, a C23 um, discectomy infusion. And I think in the, the, the appropriate patient, like a thin neck, um, and maybe look at the contour of the, of the vertebral body on a CT scan, but you can, you can get a plate that sits on the vertebral body and kind of can wobble back and forth as you're putting the screws in. So um, it's appealing, uh, but um, be careful um, if you choose that approach because there's there's uh, there's landmines that potentially can be in your way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor from uh, Doctor Baran Tashkala from my clinic uh, wrote that. Thank you, professor, for a great lecture. I listening it second times and I learn more again. My question about ACDP, we operated this from posteriorly in lumbar area, and there is no more adhesion segment disease. Maybe they are different biomechanics, but what do you think about this? Lumbar and cervical. Cervical, cervical discectomies, you mean? Yeah, he says he, he made a lumbar discectomy from posteriorly, but there yeah. is no adjacent segment disease in lumbar area. Well, I don't. I don't know that, um, but the, the lumbar discectomy, um, like the laminal foramenotomy in the cervical spine, I think the laminal foramenotomy disrupts the anatomy a little bit more than the discectomy does in the lumbar spine. Um, but, but keep in mind, in the lumbar spine, for lumbar radiculopathy, we're treating a tethering phenomenon where the nerve root is being tethered over a ventral mass. We need to get the ventral mass out. In the cervical spine, cervical radiculopathy is a stenosis problem. So all you have to do is de decompress the roof of the foramen. Of the foramen. You don't have to take out the disc. Um, and so th there, the pathologies are gonna be quite different in both regions and the operation is quite different. I'm not sure I answered that question. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Professor Akinez Gray from Izmir uh, wrote that, thank you very much for such a nice presentation. Uh, Dr. Ismail Yurt from Çanakkale, thank you for your excellence presentation, Dr. Benzer. Ali Karada 
uh, thank you, sir, for the great lecture and for sharing your experience. Great to see you. Ayhan Kahat, Professor Ayhan Kahat, uh, thank you for your good presentation. I want to ask, what do you think about the effect of Kimmerley anomaly on upper cervical osteoligomentous injuries? I don't know this. The effect of what? I... Kimmerley. Kim... Oh. If you don't know, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe he want to ask himself. Uh, is Ayhan Kanat here? I think he left. Let me check. Okay. He is here and I just sent him permission to unmute himself. Okay. Okay, we can move on and if you want, uh, we can talk later. Wefi uh, Gülmen wrote, thanks a lot for lecture of a great expert. It sounds good for see you in Turkey after pandemic. Gürkan Gürkan from my clinic. Thank you so much, Professor. It was a nice presentation. We want to see you again in Izmir. I want to be there too. Ayhan <laughs> Kanat wrote Ponticularis Posticus. For the Kimberley anomaly. Anomaly. I don't know. Okay. We will move on. Neşe Keser wrote that Professor Benzel, many thanks for sharing your valuable experiences with all of us. Okay. Thank you. I think all the questions are over. Uh, if Ayhan Kanat wants to talk himself. Okay. Uh, Karhat Arman wrote that, thank you for your ex excellent presentation. We might also see you in Istanbul after pandemic. So okay. <laughs> I hope you will choose Izmir or Istanbul after pandemic. Well, uh, you know, they're not all that far apart. I, you know, we can do both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I think all the questions are over. Let me say, um, it's so good to hear from so many of my friends, um, see their names passing by and asking questions and their faces passing by here. This has been a uh, um, kind of like a uh, reunion for me. So thank you so much. Okay, Professor. Haruk Park wrote that, well, it is time for another agent spine course. Yes, maybe, maybe. That's a great idea. <laughs> great idea. Okay. okay, sir, again, I thank you very much for accepting our offer to speak and for giving us this excellent lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you and goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, bye-bye. Have, have a great evening. Yes, okay, take care. Thank you very much. Murat kapatabiliriz.